Good evening, staff and community members. As we gather here tonight, we do so with heavy hearts as we mourn the loss of two members of our district family. Last week, we were deeply saddened to learn of the passing of two Lamar CISD elementary teachers, both who dedicated their lives to shaping the minds and hearts of our students. Their passion for teaching left a profound impact on countless lives. In honor of their memory, I ask that we observe a moment of silence. Thank you. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge to the Texas Flag led, led by sixth grader Javriel Umaya from Navarro Middle School. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one individual. Dr. Nivens, are there any recognitions or awards? Yes, ma'am. I'll turn over to Ms. Cole Hamilton. We have quite a few recognitions. And board, we can go out to the front. Trustees, Dr. Nivens, and the Lamar CISD community, and those who have joined us in person tonight. Fresh off our spring break, we have so much to celebrate around our campuses and district, and this evening we are proud to highlight several groups for the individual, district, state, and even national accolades. Even some heroes who saved a precious life. So I'm proud to amplify these achievements and celebrate these recognitions with you this evening. First, thanks to the swift actions taken by Lamar CISD athletic trainer Stacy Boudreaux Stewart, Lamar CISD police officer Edgar Viegas, and sophomore student athletic trainers Hannah Thomas and Braden Wheeler, a Lamar Consolidated High School student can breathe a sigh of relief for the foreseeable future. On February 22nd, during track practice at Lamar Consolidated High School, it started routinely enough until a student collapsed outside the field house at Trailer Stadium. The student had no pulse and was not breathing. Student trainers Thomas and Wheeler responded quickly to retrieve the defibrillator, 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 defibrillator and give paramedics access to the stadium. As paramedics were en route, Brito Stewart attached the AED and began performing CPR. Eventually, Officer Viegas arrived on site and took over the CPR duties. Incidentally, March is National Athletic Training Month, which recognizes the important work that athletic trainers perform daily, and it's a privilege to honor this entire group for their efforts. We have a token of appreciation this evening to present to honor their heroic efforts. I'm gonna get my colleague, Dr. Waits, with me. Ms. J.C. Stewart. Hannah, Hannah Thomas, Braden Wheeler, and Officer Viegas, we've got two, one from us, and then from the police chief. We've got a special pin for our officer, and he's going to be pinned by Police Chief Henry Garcia. Thank you. I know, yeah, group photo with the trustees. Yeah, come on over to the trustees. <laughs> he can switch. He and Hannah, can you two switch? There we go. Okay, it's better, a little better. Our 
obviously Vegas, one more special note. I just learned that as of August, oh, July 1st, you take on your special assignment as Sergeant in the Marciazzi. Congratulations. So continuing with our acknowledgments, in fall 2023, we recognized six seniors who were selected as National Merit semifinalists. And now, for the first time in district history, the same group of six have advanced to become National Merit Scholar finalists. Each scholar now stands to earn a coveted National Merit Scholarship, institutional awards, prestigious corporate scholarships, and financial aid packages. This is a tremendous honor for Lamar CISD and is a testament to the rigor of our college and career readiness programs and opportunities. Here to be recognized this evening from George Ranch High School, Jake Miller, Jiang Song, Ryan Skinner. From Foster High School, Lucienne Webster, Rayon Al McKee, and Brooks Bryant from Fulcher High School. And could we have the principals also join for the photo op? If those principals are here, we've got George Ranch, Foster, and Fulcher. Every year, the Texas Dance Educators Association All-State Dance Team is comprised of hundreds of dancers selected by their dance teachers for their outstanding ability, team leadership, and campus leadership. In January, these dancers spend three days participating in an exciting convention that includes workshops, leadership training, master classes, and networking with other dancers throughout the state. The All-State Dance Team experience culminates in a performance designed by a master choreographer and showcased to teachers and administrators from high school and college. This year, six dancers were selected to represent Lamar CISD on the TDEA All-State Dance Team. I will announce the student dancers and I would like to invite the students' parents and teachers to stand when their student's name is called. Representing Fulcher High School uh, Storm Dance Team is junior Megan Suri. Megan was a Storm co-captain this year. She's a member of the National Honor Society and her parents are Erica and Jean. Her mom Erica also happens to be her dance teacher. Representing the uh, Randall High School Royals dance team is junior Catherine Cisneros. Catherine served as the head captain of the Royal Dance Team, and she's also in the National Honor Society. Her parents are Tanya and Ishmael. Oh, and Tashane O'Haver is her dance teacher. Representing George Ranch Lariat is senior Campbell Balden. Oh, Campbell didn't make it tonight. We'll, we'll go to our representing Terry High School Rangerettes is senior Emily Emory Pratt. Emily served as the colonel of the Rangerettes, and she plans to attend Texas A&M University. There you go, a major in neuroscience. Her mother is Rebecca Rodriguez, and Sarah Turco is her dance instructor. Representing... Representing the Lamar High School Phillies is senior Mallory Rodriguez. Mallory served as the colonel of the Phillies dance team, and she's also president of the student council and is a Posse Foundation scholar. She plans to attend Vanderbilt University on a full ride scholarship, but she will major in elementary education. Woo her parents are Elizabeth and Avon Rodriguez, and Ambria Johnson is her dance instructor. Representing Foster High School Flares is senior Lene Bashan. Lena, Lena served as colonel of the Flares dance team. She's also in varsity tennis, as well as the African Students Association. She plans to major in engineering, and her parents are Lola and John. Juanita Velasquez is her dance instructor. Thank you. Congratulations to these ladies. Go take your picture.
Congratulations, ladies. Okay, now we will recognize our Texas Music, Music Educators Association All-State Musicians. Thousands of student musicians from across Texas regions and conferences auditioned through multiple levels of competition and cuts to become the elite in their respective vocal and instrumental fields. In Lamar CSD, we had 18 high school musicians qualify for the 2024 TMEA All-State Competition, which is a record high and places these music scholars in the top 3% in the state of Texas. These students represent this evening performed in the all-state bands, choir, and orchestras in San Antonio last month in February. When I call the student musicians, I would like for the students' parents and teachers to please stand as they are called. The students joining us from George Ranch High School Orchestra, Choir, and Band from Orchestra, Senior Afshal Subair. Afshal is Lamar CISD's first all-state orchestra musician. He's a two-time all-state musician who performed in the all-state Philharmonic Orchestra on double bass. His college is undecided, but he will major in computer science and his parents are Noreen and Muhammad. He is a student of Rupert Parker. From choir, we've got senior soprano Crow Waters. Crow is a two-time All-State soprano. She performed in the All-State Mixed Choir and plans to attend the University of Houston and major in music performance, and her father is Andrew Waters. Senior junior Tanner Harris Manasia. Harris also performed in an All-State Mixed Choir. His parents are Ajun and Ferdas Manesha. Crow and Harris are students under the direction of Charles Williams. <laughs> and in band, we've got Tim Cranston is a sophomore tubist, and Tim was a brand new, was a band section leader this year. And Will Cranston is a sophomore trombonist, and Will is also on the tennis team. Tim and Will are brothers, and they are both accepted to expected to attend the Interlochen Arts Camp in Michigan, which is a prestigious accomplishment, and their parents are Sarah and Kevin Cranston. <laughs> Spencer Fismanis is a senior percussionist, and Spencer's in the top 5% of his class. He plans to attend the University of Texas at Austin and major in music, and his parents are Michael and Jennifer Plehall. <laughs> All three students are under the direction of Chris Crumble and Thomas Piazza. The following, st oh, come on back for your picture, T kiddos. These are our George Ranch students. Not yet, not yet, Pulsher. We're gonna get our George Ranch kiddos. All right, now we'll bring on those charges. The following students are joining us from the Fulcher High School Band. Junior trumpet, Joshua Morell. Joshua's a two-time All-State musician. He was in the All-State 5A Symphonic Band. In addition to being in the band, he was a regional cross-country qualifier. His parents are Melissa and Peter. <laughs> Noah Heslop is a junior bass trombonist who performed in the All-State Sinfonietta Orchestra. In addition to being a member of the band, he is in the National Honor Society and is currently in the top 1% of his junior class. His parents are Rebecca and David. And both students are in the direction of Andrew Lee, Dr. Kenneth Cox, and Christine, you all can take your picture now, and Dr. Christine Molenkoff. <laughs> Those are our Fulcher High School Chargers. Give it up for Fulcher. All right, we've got one student from Terry High School. It's junior trombonist Fabio Marquez. Fabio is in the 5A All-State Symphonic Band. His parents are Marciela and Rogelio Marquez. Fabio is a student of Tim Taylor. Congratulations, Fabio.
Congratulations. And our last group of students we're celebrating are from the Foster High School Falcon Choir and Band. Junior soprano Kate Martin. Kate was in the All-State Mixed Choir. Kate had a supporting role in the musical this year. She's also in the top 10%, a member of Student Council and the National Honor Society. And her parents are Karen and Matt. She's a student of Jason Carson. Foster High School Band had eight all-star students this year. Jackson Ingram is a junior French hornist, and he is a two-time all-state musician. He was recently selected to perform in the National Youth Orchestra at Carnegie Hall. This summer, he will tour with the orchestra at some of the world's greatest music capitals, including venues in South Africa. And his parents are Regina and Cedric Ingram. Brennan Flores is a junior bass clar clarinetist. He is a clarinet section leader this year and is a member of the National Honor Society. His parents are Winnie Flores and Archie Rojas. <laughs> Matthew Bolinock is a two-time junior all-state alto saxophonist. He's also in the National Honor Society and is, and is the top 2% of his class. His parents are Maddie and Michael. Kaven Lynn is a junior clarinetist. He was the band section leader, a member of the National Honor Society, and is an A honor roll student. His parents are Mandy and Allen. Cassandra Davies is a senior piccolo player. She was a drum major in the band, a member of the National Honor Society, and an A roll student. She will attend the University of Houston and double major in nursing and music performance, and her parents are Maria and Wilson Davies. Anish Pogni is a senior euphonium player. Anish received a National Merit Scholar Letter of Commendation, and he will attend the University of Texas at Austin and major in physics. His parents are Payal and Todd Pagni. <laughs> Morgan Sarnier is a senior clarinetist. She was a woodwind captain of the band. She will attend the University of Houston and major in business. Her parents are Angela and Eric Sarnier. And not in attendance this evening, but still probably representing Foster High School, is Nor Lom. Nor Lom is a sophomore baritone saxophonist. He's an AB honor roll student. His parents are Fakri and Maha Laham. Yeah, these students are taught by band directors Eric Sonye and Brian Allman and Jeremy Salisbury, Jeremiah Salisbury. Thank you and congratulations to all of our wonderful state musicians. Gorgeous. Thank you, kiddos. Okay, yes, yes, now y'all can go. <laughs> Your work is done. Okay, trustees, and finally, our last recognition of the evening might fill your stomachs and your hearts. Last month, the annual Lamar Educational Awards Foundation Men Who Cook Fundraiser sizzled with success and raised approximately $190,000 in sales revenue. The funds will support student enrichment opportunities and enhance educator resources across the district. First Financial and PBK Architects presented the fundraiser with 76 celebrity chefs whipping up their tastiest dishes in a friendly competition. In addition to the title sponsors, there were more than 52 event sponsors, including nine underwriters, Equitable Act Advisors, Houston Methodist, Johnson Development, K. Danziger, Signorelli, Firetron, NCA, Calusa, and Fluger. This event would not have been possible without the generous support of our sponsors, so we thank them for supporting Lamar CISD. And that concludes our recognitions this evening. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Dr. Nivens, are there any introductions? No, ma'am, Madam President, there are not. Okay, we'll now have board member reports. Uh, trustees, if you can keep your comments and reports to one to do minutes, that would be great. Yep. Okay, you want to go? 
Well, it, <clears throat> it was spring break and everything going on, not as much as I we usually get done, but before spring break, I was asked to come read to some classes at Austin Elementary and Velasquez Elementary, and it's for Read Across America. And of course, it's one of my joys to read to the young children. And of course, it was also Dr. Seuss's birthday, so I took my bag of Dr. Seuss books. But I appreciate being invited. I appreciate the teachers, and of course, the kids were just phenomenal. And then I do want to give a shout out to uh, the Fort Bend County Retired Educators Association. Uh, every year we have a, uh, we collect books, and we collected over 200 books this year, and the recipients was Thomas Elementary this year, and about 10 of us showed up last week and uh, were able to go to the pre-K, K, and first grade classes, and again, the kids were phenomenal. They were so sweet. We write in the books. We tell them what the, they get to choose which book they want. We put a whole bunch of books out. And what's so cute, we were barely out the door, and they were running to us with thank you notes. Mm -hmm. So not only are they amazing, but, of course, you know, the teachers and the kids were uh, made us feel so appreciated. But I thank the uh, members of the chapter and all the hard work they do to collect the books. And we'll pick another school for next year. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dr. Nivens, do you have a superintendent report? Just uh, two brief ones. Uh, I want to. I want to make sure we don't. We don't. Uh, There's it it a lot of movement. I want to make sure we we pay particular attention to two of the celebrations tonight. One was our National Merit Scholars. You know those those young people. They are in. They are in the top 0.5 percent. I mean that's less than one percent of, of students <laughs> in the state of Texas. That is a humongous deal. That is. And I talked to them earlier, and I said, I can't imagine how, how proud your parents are. Uh, but they are in the top 0.5% of students in Texas. So that is, that is tremendous honor for those young people. Uh, secondly, you know, we recognize the trainer uh, and the police officer and the two student trainers. I want to make sure that, that we hear um, uh, that that student was really clinically dead. Like, that student's heart stopped beating. And the trainer jumped into action and used a defibrillator. Um, actually, she was doing CPR with the officer. And then one of the student trainers saw that she didn't have a defibrillator, and they went inside and got it without being told, right? And so, um, and saved that young man's life. And so I want to make sure we don't pass over that because, you know, most of us in this room have our own children, and I tell people, you don't know love until you have your own kid. And, you know, that young man got up that morning, went to school, and his parents were expecting to see him that night with no issues. Uh, and because of the trainer, they were able to still see him in the hospital breathing. But uh, he had stopped breathing for about five minutes, I believe. And so, uh, you know, I tell the staff, uh, you know, life is short, life is fragile. Hug your babies, hug your family. Uh, you know, everything that we're doing is serious, but it's not that serious, right? And so I want to make sure that we, that we really pay attention to, to life. You know, life, life, is, life is good. And so I'm very happy uh, for our staff to jump into action and our student trainers to jump into action. And that young man is in school now, being able to enjoy uh, his life as a young man. So, you know, I want to make sure we don't pass those over. Those are, those are very two significant events in the Mars ISD. Thank you, Dr. Nivens. Uh, Ms. Johnson, are there any public comments? It is the desire of the Lamar CISD Board of Trustees to appropriately and effectively fulfill its governance role in accordance to best practices for quality organizations and to the applicable provisions of the Texas Education Code. Trustees also desire to afford an opportunity for input from the public. Members of the community who wish to address the board must have completed a public participation, public comment card, and submitted it before the presiding officer called the meeting to order. Public participation allows individuals to address the board regarding posted agenda items. Public comment allows individuals to address the board regarding non-agenda items. Trustees may not respond to public comments as they are prohibited by law from discussing or deciding any subject that is not on the board's publicly noticed agenda. All patrons desiring to speak and who have completed the public 
public participation, public comment form will be heard during public comment or participation portion of the meeting before final board action is taken on an agenda topic. While speakers generally have five minutes to address the board, the presiding officer may establish an overall time limit for public participation and public comment and adjust the time allotted to each speaker when necessary to accommodate a large number of speakers. However, no speaker shall be given less than one minute. All of this is in compliance with HB 2840. Each speaker tonight will have five minutes. If two or more individuals are speaking on the same topic, the district strongly encourages speakers to consolidate their comments to allow for additional time on the topic. Each speaker must address the board from the podium provided unless special accommodations have been requested and approved. Speakers are to present their remarks to the board and not the audience. Speakers having complaints against individual district employees or trustees may only address the board only address the board after filing a complaint form and in the manner provided for in board policy, DGBA employee complaints, FNG student and parent complaints, GF public complaints. The presiding officer or designee shall determine whether a speaker has filed a complaint according to policy. Any speakers who complain of individual district employees or trustees during public participation, public comment will be directed by the presiding officer to stop addressing the board and will refer the speaker to the appropriate complaint policy. School board meetings are meetings held in public but are not public meetings. While the board values hearing from members of the public, Trustees will not answer questions or respond to comments from patrons. Speakers will not engage in dialogue with the trustees. Please state your name when you come forward. Our first speaker is Justin Parker. Good evening, LCISD board. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. My name is Justin Parker. I come to you as a concerned father of two elementary age students currently attending an LCISD school. It's been brought to my attention that there's a teacher at the middle school and junior high school level that uh, is currently moonlighting and openly displaying himself as a cross-dresser. This teacher I'm referring to is Sean Saunders, known as Jacqueline Dior when dressed as a woman, currently teaching at Wardheimer and Briscoe. As you can see in the pictures that I've brought, uh, that I've obtained from his Instagram account, which is public and available for anyone to see, including children in his class. Uh, a few of these pictures uh, on his Instagram and, uh, using inappropriate hashtags and uh, inappropriate sexual hashtags. Some of these captions of these pictures are, sometimes I get to step out as a boy to perform. It's a fantasy tonight, dressed as a queen. You'll hit the right note with me. I found all the hotties while standing next to men dressed in nothing but a pair of underwear. Spaghetti and meatballs is on the menu, wearing a necklace in the shape of what I can assume is a reference to male genitalia. Just a light shopping, posing next to two pictures of men in underwear. Do I make you horny, baby, dressed as a woman. Category is holiday sugar ball, peppermint for your breath, while wearing women's clothes covered in peppermint candy. Letting the girls hang out, referring to his breasts. Smart schoolgirl fantasy, dressed as a female school student. I hope to see you tonight, dressed as a woman cartoon character from a children's show. Serving Gay Jafar for Halloween, dressed as a female version of a male cartoon character from a children's movie. My hips are here, now I have tits and ass while wearing women's undergarments. Some of my favorite shoots, from some of my favorites from the shoot, which uh, with his shirt unbuttoned and provocative poses. According to the Texas Administrative Code of Ethics, Title 19, Part 7, Chapter 247, Rule 247.2, Paragraph I, Standard 3.9, the educator shall refrain from inappropriate communication with a student or minor, including but not limited to electronic communication, such as cell phone, text messaging, email, instant messaging, blogging, or other social network communication. Factors that may be considered in assessing whether the communication is inappropriate, included, but are not limited to, uh, line item three, whether the communication was made openly or the educator attempted to conceal the communication, whether the communication was sexually explicit, 
it was line five. Line six, whether the communication involved discussion of the physical or sexual attractiveness or the sexual history, activities, preferences, or fantasies of either the educator or the student. While this might not be direct communication with the students, the fact this is a public Instagram account which students can see this form of communication. I know you may think in this type of behavior may not have impacted the children in this teaching, and I can tell you that it has. I've been told firsthand by multiple students that know about his Instagram account and what he does. He even addressed it in the classroom, threatening students that make fun or bring it up that, quote, I will sue your parents if it's mentioned. This is unacceptable. How does this man who dresses as a woman and openly promote drag queen contests and other sexual activities get through any kind of background check prior to his employment in the LCISD school district? As a youth football coach myself, I know that this behavior is unacceptable and I would not be allowed to coach. Why have parents whose children are in the choir program or at the school for that matter not been warned by the school, counselors, or the district prior to their children attending this class? Children spend as much time, if not more, in school with teachers than they do at home. These children are an age where they're impressionable, vulnerable, and mostly confused, and more important, most importantly, confused. Teachers' jobs are to educate, yet so many teachers are more than just educators. They're mentors, confidants, in a lot of cases, the only form of an adult that a child has to look up to. I know when I was a student, I looked up to and admired my teachers and confided in them, in many of them, during difficult times. What kind of message is this man sending to children who have access to his Instagram account? My job as a father is to protect my children. And as a Christian man, I'm taking the responsibility to protect all the children at these schools from this type of perversion. I'm asking your help by removing this perversion from being accessed by our children. I know all of you either have young children or had children that attended public schools. So my question to each of you is, would you want your kids to be exposed to this? Because I do not. That's it. That's all the public comment. Okay. At this time, we'll take action on the consent agenda. Are there any items that the board would like to pull? Okay, let's see, may I have a motion to approve the current consent agenda? I'll make a motion. Okay, Ms. Danziger, and uh, is there a second? Mr. Welch. Okay, any discussion? Okay. I'll now, yes, yes. I'll now call for the vote. All in favor of approving the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, and uh, we will now have reports and presentations on the future action items. All right, Madam President, I'll turn it over to Mr. Buchanan. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Dr. Nevins. Tonight we want to bring forth a discussion about the schematic design for the new Brazos Crossing. Um, this site is located um, south of Avenue I from Trailer Stadium across from the Service Center. Again, <clears throat> excuse me, again, this parking lot on the uh, west side of the building has been laid out to expand the visitor parking and the parking for Trailer Stadium using the existing traffic control light. The programming, which is of the facilities, will be utilized by these areas will be curriculum instruction, communication, finance, human resources, operations, superintendent, and student services. So our floor plan on the first floor, if you'll look on the top section, that is the two large meeting rooms that can be divided, or two, one large meeting room that can be divided into two. It also has six smaller meeting rooms um, along that side. Just south of that is the board room um, that is laid out there. Moving across, you have the Human Resources Department, the Finance Department, and Student Services. Um, the reason those three are located on the first floor is because easy access. We have a lot of students and parents and staff that meet with those three areas. On the second floor, um, the large teal section is curriculum instruction. So that puts all of curriculum instruction. Um, now they're scattered throughout all underneath one um, area. So they're all contained in one space. And then on the northern side of the building, which is this peach area, would be the superintendent's office operations and communications. So the project timeline, um, Right now, we're on schedule to have a, a guaranteed maximum price, the first one in October of 2024, our second one in October of 2025. Um, construction will begin in November of 2024, and then construction completion um, is estimated to be at the end of April of 2026. 
Are there any questions? No questions. All right, board, next we will have Ms. Sonia Cole Hamilton and Mr. Buchanan. All right, I would like to invite Vanessa Marsters to join us. You can have a seat in the front row. Let's also have Christina Garcia and Danielle Kratz also join us on the front row. All right, trustees, so in a growing school system, it is inevitable that we're going to have to revisit our attendance boundaries to accommodate our hyper growth. And in Lamar CISD, we have three approaches to managing our growing enrollment. Cap and overflow, that's when we stop enrollment at a campus and we send students to a neighboring campus. Um, another option is we simply build new campuses. And when we build new campuses, we rezone to create the population of students who will attend that campus. And our third approach is leveling, and that's what we're going to discuss this evening. And leveling is when we look at the enrollment in our existing campuses. We identify the campuses that are over enrollment. We identify the campuses that are under enrollment, under capacity, and we look how we can better balance students shifting attendance boundaries to create a more balanced enrollment across campuses. And so last month, we had our attendance boundaries committees meet. And so before you on the screen, this is the roster of the attendance boundary committee for the Central Lamar CISD leveling. Um, Committee members notated in blue uh, were present for one or both meetings, and those who are grayed out weren't able to join us in person. Um, part of our process is to send out a survey to the impacted uh, community of parents, and so we sent 3,899 email addresses, surveys to 3,899 email addresses, and we received 747 responses, that's 19 percent, and on the screen you can see the breakdown of the campuses that provided responses. Essentially, um, based on their survey, when we asked which option did they prefer, overwhelmingly, they preferred option four with 68 percent. And so we presented um, the survey information as well as the map options to our attendance boundary committee for them to deliberate and decide um, how they were going to rank the options and whether or not they were going to create an option. And so this evening, we've got um, a committee chair to share with you all the process as well as the outcome. So for the central leveling this evening, we have Ms. Vanessa Marsters joining us. Ms. Marsters? Good evening, Dr. Nivens, Board of Trustees. My name is Vanessa Marsters, and I'm representing the Central Lamar ABC. I will be presenting the map recommendation as chosen by the committee. Before I present the recommendation on behalf of the committee, we understand that the board is not required to form an ABC when leveling and rezoning. We want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to have a voice in this decision-making process. One takeaway from the meeting is that it is of the utmost importance that those who accept the invitation or nominate themselves to serve on such a committee take the time to prepare for it. At an absolute minimum, having either attended or watched the previous board meetings, this will ensure the committee members come front-loaded and prepared to make effective decisions based on background information already presented and decided. That being said, and keeping in mind the objectives and criteria set Fourth, by the district, map four, uh, map option four, provides for the most relief to Frost Elementary, which reduces overcrowding and allows for potential future growth from 125 percent to 91 percent. It keeps an entire neighborhood together and considers the elementary students' proximity to the campus, 8.6 miles, a 15-minute drive, compared to a 2.8-mile drive, a uh, six-minute drive and eliminates railroad crossings, which provides for a safer route and traffic patterns, eradicates moving a neighborhood previously affected by a rezoning. As you can see, uh, the survey received 68% of the surveyed responses with option one at 20% and option two at 12%. The ABC ranked the options and map four was ranked number one by the ABC re receiving 82% option one receiving 18%, and option two res receiving 0%. The most important factor for the committee being that maps, map option four provides for the least disruption of Central Lamar. 
which is what is in the best interest of the students. This was a eight versus 11 uh, in disruptions. The first two options had 11 disruptions and the fourth one had only eight. So the committee recommends MAP option four with the standard legacy provision. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. So to continue with the reference to legacy provision, so that means current fourth grade students, students who are going to be fifth graders next year, um, will be offered the opportunity to remain at their campus. This legacy provision is not extended to siblings, and parents would have to provide transportation. So trustees, while this is not an action item for you this evening, I do want to share what it looks like once you all do take action next month. We're going to update the zoning page of the district website uh, with the final approved attendance zone maps, and um, we will notify the impacted families within 30 to 45 days of the board decision, so likely the end of May, and we will send messages to directly impacted families. Trustees, are there any questions you have about this item at this time? <laughs> All right. We wait one second. One oh. second. Uh, this is the time in the meeting where the public has the opportunity to, per to participate. Ms. Johnson, are there any public participations? Our first public participation speaker is Leslie Gracia. Hi, I'm Leslie Gracia. Good, good evening, um, Dr. Nevins and the school board trustees. I wanted to talk about the leveling, and um, I wanted to ask you to please vote no to releveling at this time for this year. Um, based on the criteria and objectives that Lamar CISD has outlined for themselves, I don't feel those have been met. Some of these overlap, but I'm going to go through them. Um, the first one I would say is fairness. Um, at the December workshop and board meetings, there were no Jackson families present when a new map was made, that option four map was made. Nobody from Jackson was here or present. Um, we, Kingdom Heights and the Jackson families were also, I don't believe, um, fairly represented at the ABC. I believe there was only one parent that actually showed up from Jackson at the ABC. And um, I don't think Keenum Heights, based on the proportion of what we're having to deal with, were adequately represented at the ABC. Um, another one I wanted to talk about is what's best for the students. Um, we just heard that it this option four that was uh, voted uh, the, the best option that people thought. It has less uh, disruption by neighborhoods, but not students. Kingdom Heights alone are going to disrupt 333 students. We're moving out Riverside Terrace, which would affect 86 students. So the number of students is higher. Um, and we also have on your objective criteria the effectiveness and the efficiency of this change. Jackson will be over capacity very soon, and there is no room for portables. Again, the projections for Keenum Heights being built out, we will be over 500. The projections are 500 students. We are going to be way under, way over capacity at Jackson, Jackson, and there's no room for portables. So what's going to happen to our students? Are you going to move out the rest of the Jackson students currently there? Keenum Heights are going to be capped and overflowed somewhere else. That's that goes back to fairness again. Um, also, campus capacity. With this option four, we still have three elementary schools running at half capacity. If you move Keenum Heights into Jackson and remove Riverside Terrace, we're still running at 75, um, per, I'm sorry, 86% capacity at that time with no room to grow still. And Frost will still be at 91% capacity. We have schools running at 50% capacity. Why aren't more neighborhoods being moved out of Frost to get that to that? I think the number was 75% that Lamar CISD wanted the 
elementary schools to run at. Um, I don't see how that's making any sense. Um, and the proximity and the route. You met half the capacity for, I mean, half the criteria for that because Keenum Heights is closer to Jackson, but we still do not have a safe route to get there. I haven't really heard any kind of comprehensive plan on how families from Kingdom Heights are gonna get safely to Jackson. And then again, we're also busing students that are very close to Jackson, Riverside Terrace. They're gonna be bused further away to another school. Um, I don't see how that criteria is met either. Um, and last, to communicate information to all the students and families. Jackson, again, was left out. No one was there at those board workshops um, and the board meetings, and they were underrepresented at the ABC. So I would really, again, like to ask the board to please vote no until we have time to have a better, more fair, comprehensive plan by what LCISD has outlined for themselves, the criteria and objectives you outline for yourselves. I don't think that's been met yet. And if you wait a year to vote, I mean, if you vote no for this year and wait to give us more time to come up with a better plan that is fair for everyone, I think that would be best. So that's what I'm asking for Kingdom Heights and for the Jackson families, Riverside Terrace particularly. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary Barnes. Hello. <clears throat> My name is Mary Barnes. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Nivens, President Bronzel, and trustees, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm going to ask a rhetorical question because I know you can't respond. Um, does anyone in this room believe that the area currently zoned to Foster High School is done constructing new homes? Anybody? I think we all know the answer is absolutely not. So I wanted to ask why all three options for the new maps um, for the opening of Tomas High School would move students that are currently zoned to Lamar Consolidated High School, Lamar Junior High, and Wessendorf Middle School, which are all running significantly under enrollment cap, and move them into Foster, Wertheimer Middle School, and Briscoe Junior High, which are all very, very close to their enrollment cap or even overflowing already into portables. Um, moving students from low enrollment campuses to a high enrollment campus defies logic, especially as we are still experiencing this hyper growth in the district. And the population around Foster has grown significantly in the eight years since I built my home in Kingdom Heights. I can only assume within the next five years, it's going to continue to grow where there are large plots of acreage and developers still buying land to develop on. I would urge the board to reject these short-term solutions that might solve problems for a year or two and look to the future. You, we must ask for a fourth map to be developed for the Tomas rezoning that does not move students into Wertheimer M Middle School, Briscoe Junior High, or Foster High School. Even with the addition of 500 new students at Foster, this is illogical to me. Now, in the ABC and before, when we were talking about demographics and where Kingdom Heights could potentially be moved outside of Jackson. We were told that the enrollment at Bentley Elementary, which is a far more comparably rated school to Frost, which we are currently at, um, with the opening of Terrell and Elementary School 35, their enrollment numbers drop significantly enough that we could be accommodated at Bentley as the numbers stand today. Um, however, we were also told that the, where those numbers stand today isn't an accurate prediction of the future growth in Candela, Sorrento, and other new neighborhoods. So why wouldn't that same logic apply when we're talking about Foster High School, Briscoe Junior High, and Wertheimer Middle School when we're looking at adding students from other areas into those schools? I also want to use the remainder of my time to touch on a few things that are very important. Um, I was shocked learning about the disparity of performance between Frost, where my students, my, my children currently attend, and Jackson Elementary School. The rankings, even if they don't matter to everyone in this room, they're the only tool that we have to measure success of a school. I feel that it's not the student's fault, it's not the parent's fault, definitely not the teacher's fault at Jackson, but to have a disparity of over 2,000 schools lower 
than Frost. We're talking Frost is rated by the TEA 135th in Texas out of 4,500 elementary schools. Jackson is rated 2,175. So that's a significant drop. If you wanna shuffle students around to address the hypergrowth, which I understand is a necessity, you need to make sure that all schools are performing on a comparable level. So Frost, I understand, is a top-notch school. It's part of why we bought and built our home where we did. We're devastated to lose it. I have a first grader who can't be legacied in. My fourth grader hopefully will get to finish his final year at Frost where he's been since he was in kindergarten. But all of the schools in this district should be performing at a level where you can move from one school to another without feeling a huge disparity. And that is not the case between these schools. So I will be an involved parent at Jackson. I hope to help the school and the educators there in any way possible. But I just wanna say, as a district, as a whole, we have money, we have passed bonds. Bring up the lower performing schools so that another neighborhood doesn't have to face what we're facing right now. If they were all in the middle, it wouldn't make any difference. We'd be sad to leave our school, but it wouldn't be the same crushing defeat that we are facing right now. Many people are pulling their kids out of public education, choosing charters, homeschool, even selling their homes. So the board needs to understand and address these issues. It's extremely important. Finally, I wanna say to have only a few high performing schools makes the rest of us fight over these table scraps when we should be fostering a sense of community within all of It shouldn't be, we got ours, they can get theirs. Sorry, your time's up. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Our next speaker is Matthew Jeter. Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Dr. Nibbins. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to get to speak to you tonight. My name is Matthew Jeter. I'm a proud father of two uh, elementary students at Frost, uh, and then we'll have a third next year. What I, what I want to talk about tonight is processes and facts. So with the leveling we heard back in December, there are a lot of emotions. Dr. Nivens, you said, you know, you wanted to set the record straight about untruths that are out there. Um, but the emotions that go through that with people potentially having their kids moved um, based on the neighborhood that they live in uh, and what they had previously planned for, but change is inevitable. And the fact is, is that Frost was never designed to hold the current enrollment of students that it currently has, which is close to 1,100. It was designed to hold 854. Um, it was never designed to hold the 100 plus staff members that are there to manage those 1,078 students. Uh, it was never designed, elementary was never designed to have seven-year-olds <clears throat> having five to eight minutes for lunch. It was never designed for fifth graders to be going to the same restroom as a second grader, as a first grader, but it is adapted to that based on the current capacity that's at. Um, Ms. Foster and her staff do a tremendous job of managing that school campus and those students, and we could not be more proud to be part of that family, but the fact is, is that it's over capacity you entrusted the public to be part of a committee and the statistics of what was presented is 68% that said, hey, option four is the way that we should go. It, is, it provides the most relief with the less impact for the schools. Yep. I urge you to continue with that process with what the committee has put forth before you to say that option four is the way to go and that's how we should proceed forward because right now frost is over capacity and if we choose that option or the board chooses that option based on what the abc came up with then that provides relief for frost and it spreads students through the other schools who are currently under capacity so again the facts are is that frost is over capacity and it needs relief and we have the ability to vote on that. You guys have the ability to vote on that to provide the relief now. We should not wait another year because as it's been previously stated, the area is continuing to see growth 
development. There's still a lot of land in the Fort Bend County area that is under development, and it's only going to continue to increase. Students are only going to continue to increase uh, at the different schools, but we have that opportunity to ensure that schools are properly leveled per the process that you ask us to be part of. Thank you. Our next speaker is Scott Rickerson. Good evening, my name is Scott Rickerson. I live in the Kingdom Heights neighborhood. I was on the uh, ABC for the Frost Elementary uh, leveling. I didn't, I also felt like we weren't that well represented. I was one of the few that was from Kingdom Heights and we were outvoted on, the, on all those numbers that were shown. We wouldn't have, we, we really didn't have any options. The only options was option four to keep our neighborhood together. We agreed to do that, and, and that was the only option that we saw, That, but we still, no one in our neighborhood actually liked it. We wanted to stay at Frost. We feel like uh, the discrepancy between Frost Elementary and Jackson, I've got the, the Texas Education Agency's rankings, Frost 131, Bentley, which was an option previously for our neighborhood apparently when they were building it, but it changed real quick because there's so much building in that area, was 508. Jackson is 2142. You've got over a 2,000 difference by the TA rankings between Frost and Jackson. So our kids are going from a top ranking school to a fairly low ranking school. There's 2,000 different in, in the rankings of all elementary schools in Texas. I, I believe the word fairness which I drive by Wertheimer School almost every day, and I see out in front the Citizen Awareness Board or whatever they call it. This month, it's fairness, and I think fairness. Let's let's try and be fair. We our neighborhood has never tried to to tell any other neighborhoods that you should be going here, you should be going there. We all felt like we were attacked for one, and blindsided for two. Uh, there is options of waiting a year because the new school, the new schools going in is going to alleviate a lot of, a, a lot of students going to Bentley. Bentley is projected in next year, the 24-25, to have 716. They have room for 854. In 25-26, it's only 526. They have room for 854. So if you wait one year, there's an option to send us to a more comparable school. There's the fairness, where the fairness comes in, where it was brought up. The, there shouldn't be such a discrepancy going from one school to another, and I, I don't think it, hurt, it, it, it helps anybody. That neighborhood that in Jackson, there was one representative at the ABC from Jackson that was brought up, and she was in tears because she grew up in that neighborhood. Her kids have gone to that neighbor, walked to that school, and now her whole neighborhood's gonna be bussed away. And she's lived there her whole life and, and went to that school herself and, and, and raised her kids there and expected to, to be able to do the same. There, now, now she was in tears when, when it came to the end and because now her neighborhood that she's lived in her whole life is gonna be totally changed and the, and the kids can't even walk to school anymore. You know, that's, that's where fairness comes in. Fairness comes in with the amount of money that's poured into the district, we're going from a, a high-rated school to probably the oldest school in the district. I'm not sure, but I, just by doing a little research, Jackson is, is, is a very old school. And it's like we, we've, we've voted to, to pass the, the bonds. We passed the bonds, but yet we're going from a highly-rated school backwards after supporting the district and, and, and trying to, to, to grow and, and, build, and build schools. So we're, we're going from a, a, a very highly rated school, a newer school, back to an old school. So, I mean, it's, it's like, there's your fairness again. Uh, I, I appreciate your time. I, I wish you'd take into consideration of just holding off one year, waiting for Bentley, the numbers to change, and, and uh, have an option to, to get us to go to Bentley for 
our neighborhood to go to Bentley for the for the foreseeable future because it's it's a little bit more comparable school to Frost. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lance Williams. Good evening, appreciate the opportunity to come and speak and also represent uh, Frost Elementary on the ABC. Uh, my name is Lance Williams. I am the dad of three Lamar CISD students, one at Frost who, is he in third grade? He's in third grade still. Uh, an eighth grader and a sophomore, um, Briscoe, and then at Foster. Um, I just wanted to come up, I guess I want to change a little bit before I get to what I wanted to say, because I've got five minutes and I'm used to two or one in this room. Um, and I am a pastor, so I talk long. So there you go. Uh, nonetheless, I would like to say this. I think um, for all, my wife is also a teacher at Frost, which I've tried to keep out of the public, um, my comments anyways. Um, she's there. She has to deal with all the things that Mr. Jeter was talking about on a daily basis. It, they are doing a great job managing all the chaos. Um, to delay for another year, I think would be, I don't want to use a... Uh, too much of a word here, but it's, it would be catastrophic for that campus. Just having um, the amount of students in that, in that building, um, it's got to be limiting uh, up against the limits of the fire code. But uh, I would just plead with y'all to not do that. Having said that, the reason why I wanted to come up tonight was very simple, and I think I can do this in three minutes and less, or 45 seconds or less, is just to thank y'all. Uh, to thank y'all for being humble, um, Humility usually uh, it gets paired with curiosity and with listening, and I sense that y'all have done that. Y'all have restored my faith in local politics. I don't know if y'all consider yourselves local politicians, but I do. Um, y'all have restored my faith in that, um, in that y'all have gone out of your way to hear us. Um, even when it's been angry, even when it's been a bit incoherent, Y'all have responded, I think, with grace and humility, and that's been evidenced by the, by the process that you've gone through so far. So I just wanted to come up and tell all of you thank you uh, for being humble and curious and having listening, listening ears, but especially to two trustees of uh, Trustee Hotzel and Trustee Welch, who I don't think represent me as a homeowner. Maybe you do. I don't really see or understand how all that works out. Um, but um, without your... Uh, creativity, problem-solving abilities, practicality, even Ms. Bronzel bringing up maps that it felt like in the room didn't make a lot of sense, but I knew why you were doing it. It was to show like there's no other option. This Bentley option that keeps being brought up was proved to not be an option in a board meeting that's still online somewhere. Again, with the new elementary school, was proved to not be an option. It seems like y'all have done, in my estimation, everything you can do to make everyone happy. And yet you know you can't do that. And I know that you can't do that. We all know that you can't make everyone happy, but you have done your best to listen and to attempt to do that and make the most folks at least happy. Uh, I know that the Kingdom Heights folks will disagree with that, and I, 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 I don't know what to do with that. But I do want to say thank you, uh, for you two especially, for bringing practicality and humility, uh, creativity and curiosity uh, to be able to come up with a solution, which did turn for my neighborhood in Pecan Lakes um, a situation that was of maximum loss and minimal gain. Maximum loss in my neighborhood, minimal gain for the district. And it's turned the tide now to where be able, hopefully, and I don't know how this is all going to shake out. It's yet to be determined. But um, ultimately, even if it doesn't turn out that way, I would still say thank you for being humble and, and, and having listening ears for all of us. Um, I would also like to say thank you to the ABC members. Uh, that could have been a real ugly couple days. And it wasn't, even when we disagreed between Kingdom Heights and other neighborhoods. It was cordial. Um, it was mostly kind. Um, it didn't get out of hand. And I want to thank all of them for uh, just being kind. Uh, this can be, uh, we've seen it, very emotional, very difficult. And so I just wanted to spend my time appreciating you all, saying thank you for your efforts to make sure that there is a district-wide solution that is a little bit uh, out of the box. It wasn't on the first three. And you were able to listen and uh, establish a fourth option for, I think, the better of the whole district. So thank you very much. That's all the speakers we have. All right, Madam President, <clears throat> we will have our uh, Southeast Lamar CISD. Um, 
presentation by Ms. Cole Hamilton and Ms. Buchanan again. Thank you, Dr. Nivens. So you've heard the reason and rationale to why and how we approach our enrollment management, and this is another item to present leveling. Much like the Central Lamar, we formed the Southeast Lamar to address um, leveling concerns on that side of the district. The attendance boundary roster is featured on the screen right now. Those in blue attended one or both of the meetings, and the individuals in gray were unable to join us. Our chairs this evening are Christina Garcia and Danielle Krantz, but during the ABC, uh, this committee had an opportunity to reverse to review survey data. Um, surveys were sent to 4,288 email addresses. We received 1,220 responses that equated to 28%. And the survey results showed it was pretty close. 48% wanted option one, 52% uh, preferred option three. So at this time, we will bring up our committee chairs to talk about their experiences and ultimately what the committee um, would like to present to you all this evening as their ranking recommendations. Good evening, uh, Board of Trustees and Dr. Nivens. Thank you for having us here to present our ABC's choice to the Board of Trustees. We are honored to be the co-chairs for the Southeast Lamar ABC. I'm Danielle Krantz, and this is Christina Garcia. We are both parents and educators, so we understand the impact that these difficult decisions have on both families and schools. This process was necessary yet extremely challenging due to logistical constraints as well as the desire to disrupt as few homes as possible while still making a concerted effort to level campus enrollment. Whenever there is rezoning or leveling in a district, there's going to be disappointment because many students are potentially being separated from their friends, their teachers, and a school culture that they have been a part of. Change is hard, especially for kids. Um, and it was really important to us that we kept that in mind during these deliberations. And as a committee, we knew that it was important to make sure that we did this right in order to avoid being in the same situation over the next few years. Good evening. I value how LCISD involves parents in the rezoning process and gives them a voice. LCISD has been stated many times as a hypergrowth district, and it's important to fully utilize the current facilities we have to balance the growth. This is the second ABC committee I've been a part of, and it's provided me with a deeper understanding of the difficult decisions school districts must make on a daily basis. While the process is challenging, as Danielle stated, it is a necessary undertaking. Parents and students are very passionate about their schools, and it's upsetting to all involved to relocate students to different campuses. It's hard for students to be separated from their friends, teachers, and administrators, as well as their beloved school community. Our goal as a committee was to cause the least number of student disruptions while utilizing the current facilities to balance the overcrowding. We worked diligently as a committee to meet the zoning principles set forth by the district. As a committee, initially we set out to create a new map. We worked really hard and came up with a few scenarios that were close to viable options. However, our goal was to choose a map that balanced the schools and provided student stability for the longest amount of time. And that meant the committee, um, we were not able to come up with anything better than what was presented. Um, we did overwhelmingly choose option three for a variety of reasons, but most importantly, the fewest number of students were impacted in this option. Um, I think in option one, it's over 700 students, 759 students that were going to be rezoned. In option three, it's 350. Additionally, this option best utilizes the facilities in the southeast and does not affect schools that were reorganized in 2022. Option three breaks up the fewest neighborhoods, and we felt very strongly that students should not be crossing Highway 59 to get to their campus, nor should students who currently walk to their campus have to change schools. Again, to reiterate, our ABC committee overwhelmingly chose option three. Additionally, our committee su supports the legacy provision as well, allowing fourth graders to be grandfathered in for their fifth grade year. Danielle and I both think, would like to thank our campus principals for choosing us to be a part of this committee and thank the rest of the committee members for choosing us to be the co-chairs for the evening. At this time, we're open to any questions any of you board members may have. Thank you. 
So as stated, trustees, even though this is a future action item, part of the um, plan would be to allow current fourth grade students the option of the legacy provision, which means that they'll be fifth graders next year and they can remain at their campus. This option is not extended to siblings and parents would provide transportation. And much like the previous presentation, um, trustees, once you do take action, we will update the zoning page at the website with the final approved attendance zone maps. And then we will notify impacted families within 30 to 45 days of the board's decision, which will be by the end of May. And we are gonna send messages directly to those impacted families. Thank you. Any questions? No? Okay. Uh, Madam President, I, I, I wanna make one comment. Um, uh, I, I appreciate the chair, the, the co-chairs uh, for coming and making a comment. Uh, as a superintendent, you know, I'm, I'm the lead advocate for our students, our staff, and also for the board. And so, uh, as they said, you know, they, they tried to create a map. And I sat in the room, and we, about an hour, hour and a half, and tried to create a map, and, um, and uh, could not create one that was better. And so, in that meeting, I said, you know, we, you know, I, I have a team up here that's, uh, they're experts at what they do. Uh, they use a lot of data. This, I mean, this is what they do all day, every day. And um, I made a comment that while some of the communications that the board and I received and my team received were nice and, and cordial, um, I would say 80% were not. Uh, and they were very tactful, they were very hurtful, um, um, made some personal attacks at people, at seven folks who are volunteering their time, uh, and other people who do this every day, all day. And so while we want the feedback, uh, the way you send the feedback is always better appreciated. You know, there's a famous author that said, you know, people seldom remember what you say, but they always remember how you make them feel. And so, you know, as my staff is here working every day, doing the best they can, and I have seven trustees up here volunteering their time, and they could be at home right now, uh, running elections, paying money for signs, and doing all the things that I asked them to do, making the hard decisions I asked them to make. You know, I just ask the community, you know, when you, when you disagree with what's happening in our school system first, you know, watch the board meetings, get engaged, get involved. But when you have questions and comments, they don't have to be attackful. They don't have to be hurtful. We don't have to disagree and be disagreeable. We could disagree and still go have chocolate cake at the end of the disagreement, right? Uh, and so I just want to say that because as we continue to do this, we are a hyper-growth school system. Uh, and this is not the end. We, ha we are opening nine campuses in the next 18 months. We're opening nine campuses in the next 18 months. And so although we may not have to do this again you know, next year, it's going to happen again. And any decision we make in the school system, I need you to know that we have people that are doing the absolute best they can. No one wakes up every morning and says, what's the worst thing I can do for kids today? No one does that. And so as you're considering sending us feedback, uh, wrap it around something that's a little bit more positive so it could be, it could be better received. I, I would appreciate that. Okay, at this time we'll take action on the action items. Um, all right, <laughs> it's, the, it's, the great, it's the great Buchanan show tonight. Good evening, Board Trustees and Dr. Nevis. Tonight we will bring forth a discussion and possible action for our uh, design development for our CTE Center. Our, CT, our CTE Center will be located at the corner of Klosterhof and Spur 10. Our design committee, uh, these are our committee members. This was option one that they looked at. This was option two. This was option number three. And the ranking that the committee came up with was option three was ranked first at 14 votes, option one second at 13 votes, and option two third with five votes. Our bidding for this will be two separate GMPs, um, first one will be in June of 24. Second will be in September of 24. We're going to be, begin construction in October of 24 with a construction completion in June of 2026 with a fall of 26 opening. Are there any questions? No questions. Okay. Um. Do I make this motion? Yeah, is there a motion 
I'll, I'll make a motion. Go ahead. Uh, I move that we accept the committee's ranking of option number three uh, as the first, as, as the option to go with. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, and any discussion? No, I, I just wanna say that the folks who might be tuning in now for the first time to hear conversations about this, most of this conversation has been had in the last couple of months on previous meetings archived on YouTube on the, on the Lamar channel, so. There has been discussion about it, even though there's not tonight necessarily. Okay, um, I'll now call for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No, nope. motion carries. All right, next board we have uh, item 10B, Ms. Cohampton. Thank you, sir. And I would like to invite the following in attendance to come sit in the front row at this time. Tiffany Moyer. And Julie Gomez. Okay, trustees. So what Melton Elementary and Randall Elementary and Terrell Elementary opening in August 2024 um, and 35 and 36 opening in August 25, we've got to rezone some elementary campuses to create the population of students who will attend these new campuses. So this item is to talk about the Melton, Randall, and Elementary 36 Attendance Boundary Committee. The ABC roster is presented on the screen before you. Again, those in blue were in attendance for one or both meetings, and those in gray were not able to join us. Our committee chair for this ABC is Ms. Tiffany Moyer. And much like our previous ABC, they did receive survey data as well as maps and this particular survey went to 4,402 email addresses we received 1,071 responses which was 24 percent and now for our rezoning we had two map options they had to select a preference for the 24-25 school year and a 25-26 school year so for the 24-25 school year option one via the survey respondents was the preferred option and for the 25-26 school year option one remained the preferred option. At this time, I am going to bring up Ms. Moyer so she can share her perspective as an ABC committee member. Hi, good evening, Dr. Nevins and Board of Trustees. I am Tiffany Moyer. I'm representing uh, the purple track for the ABC. During our process, we studied each map and looked at the projected numbers given to us by the district and their employees. Um, we tried to see if there was a better option out there <clears throat> by um, using their computer program that showed us how many students were currently enrolled in different sections of neighborhoods. Um, unfortunately, we did not come up with a better option and we would like to recommend option one um, be the new boundaries for our um, track. The reasons why we chose this option, um, it provided leveling for all of our campuses. It did not move neighborhoods that were previously moved in a rezoning. Um, it helped keep buses off Texas Heritage Parkway. Um, it was voted most from the survey that was sent home to the parents and staff. Um, and it kept most neighborhoods together besides two sections that were in Tamron. Like I said, we tried to see if it was possible to keep them in Tamron, but it did not work out. Um, by choosing option one, we believe it did a good job in balancing the number of students at all schools and provided the least amount of disruption for students. We also recommended that the legacy program and, um, be allowed and all fourth grade students currently enrolled at their campuses be allowed to continue in their fifth grade year. And so trustees, as she stated, that fourth that legacy provision um, would not be extended to siblings. Parents would provide transportation. Now, trustees, this is an action item for this evening. So after you take action, we will update the zoning page of the district website with the final approved attendance zone map. And then within 30 to 45 days of your board decision this evening, which would be the end of April, we intend to notify, um, send messages directly to those impacted families. Now, in addition, trustees, um, 
with uh, the opening of Milton Randall and their elementary school, we had the chance to uncap some campuses. As you know, for about two years, we've had to uh, limit enrollment at some campuses. So uncapping information will also be sent to those families. And the Triple C is recommending that we apply a legacy provision in that instance as well, meaning that any student who is a current fourth grader who will be a fifth grader can choose to remain at that overflowed campus should they decide. And again, per our legacy provision, the parents would have to provide transportation. Otherwise, once we uncap a campus, all students who've been overflowed will be um, rezoned back to their original campus. Any questions? Does this map uncap almost all of the ones that are capped now, or is any of them gonna have to stay capped for next year only? Yes, ma'am. We, we're going to. You want to speak? So we're going to uncap the campuses. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We'll be uncapping Lindsay, Tamaron, Huggins, and Morgan. Morgan. But not Cuban X. Well, that is a that's ne the next. That's, that's the next item. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's when. I, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm getting. Ahead. I'm just like the other, getting ahead of myself. That's Lindsay. Any other questions? Okay. No. Okay, um, is there a motion? I'll make the motion to consider approval of the elementary attendance zones presented for number, number one, number one, for option. I'll go back. Make the motion that we accept option one presented by the committee. Is there a second? Box seconds. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, motion passes. Okay. All right, board, now we have item 10C. Thank you, Dr. Nivens. So our final item regarding leveling rezoning is the rezoning for the attendance elementary zones for Terrell, Elementary and Elementary 35. Um, Terrell Elementary opens next school year. Elementary 35 opens in August 25. The attendance boundary committee roster is displayed for you on the screen. Those in blue attended one or both meetings. Those in gray were not able to join us. Our committee rep for this ABC is Ms. Julie Gomez. This committee, much like the others, did receive survey results. This survey went to 5,157 email addresses. We received responses from 1,248, which represents 24%. Um, much like the previous item, they had the chance to pick maps for the 24-25 school year as well as the 25-26 school year. And so for the 24-25, it was a pretty close split um, with option three coming out slightly ahead with 37% preference. But then we went to look at the next school year, option one came out slightly ahead with a 37% preference. And so this evening we do have our committee chair here to talk through the committee process and ranking and answer any questions for you. Hi, thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Julie Gomez, as she just said. Um, I am from my home campus of McNeil Elementary. And what I really appreciated was how diverse of a group they had for our attendance boundary committee. They really got a pretty good representation of everybody that was there. Everybody was very passionate and really felt um, for the students and wanted to do everything in the best interest that they could for them. Every map we were presented, I felt, was very detailed. And we were given lots of extensive knowledge about why these maps were presented to us and ways that they were trying to uh, minimize impact to students, but also level out how many students were enrolled in each one. Um, we chose to support option one with ours. Um, we felt it was imperative for us as a committee to protect the integrity of our students' support systems that they have within each of their home campuses and keep our communities together. And that was essential, um, we felt, for the well-being of our students and provides the best environment for them to learn and when they can stay with their communities and that support system. Um, option one also had improved logistics for commutes to school, um, parents as well as school and bus transportations. Um, having the legacy clause in place I feel like was a wonderful idea. It really helped make us feel comfortable and give some sense of comfort to the students that are having to move from campus to campus. Um, while we know that many campuses with our choice won't feel relief um, of the overflow during the 24-25 school year, they will feel that relief um, 
and the, the long-term relief will come with our selection in the 25-26 school year. Um, the students and staff will experience the benefit that the students and staff will experience by waiting that extra year um, will really make the difference for these kids to have that long-term relief versus it feeling kind of temporary, wanted it to be a lasting um, effort where you could still enjoy that community that you're used to. And we chose to rely also or refer back to our survey results, which on the first initial one for the 24-25 school year, we uh, we're very, you could, even in the survey, we were very split in our first votes as well as a committee. We were split between options one and three. Um, revisiting the survey brought us back to our 25-26 school year where we saw that option one was the more of a long-term goal where we saw more leveling amongst the students amongst all campuses and felt like that was going to be worth the wait, that seeing that um, leveling occur was gonna be worth that wait. And even the 24 and 25 will still be tight. We'll still have campuses that are pretty high on capacity. We're hoping that, that you guys will agree with us that that will be worth the wait and to see the relief in 25, 26. Okay, and trustees, much like our previous items. Yeah, questions? Oh, questions. Yeah. I just decided I just decided to notice I stepped back too soon. Uh, can you talk about what the committee talked about regarding Hubenac Elementary? Because Hubenac has been overcrowded for the longest of any of our schools, if, if I'm not mistaken. And I've gotten an email, and there's been some chatter that if we go with the option that you all recommend, it won't give enough relief to Hubenac Elementary. So was there was there discussions of that in the committee? There was. Do we have a slide that kind of pulls up options one, two, and three next to each other? prepared it's like what they would show um, so all of them actually are um, pretty high for hub neck they won't see a ton of relief in all of them um, option two which is the one where they did see some uh, relief there it wasn't very like people just didn't really support it um, for options one as well as options three it was a little it was tighter for the opinions but the representatives we have there from Hubbinick, we had to take, they, they did share their opinions on that. And they, even though they know that they're still going to stay very high to being capped, they felt like it was still like they could do it. Like they didn't want to tear their school apart too much. They wanted to keep that community. That was very important to them, was keeping that community feeling. And they do, Hubbinick does see some relief in option one. Um, across it's just not going to really be felt until the 25 26 school year for option one whoever highlighted for me so you all are recommending option one we are uh, recommending option one. i know whoever had my little pointer pointed at option three so am i not seeing something correct uh if you if you play that out through the years 27 28 hubenek is still over 900 kids all those years is that is that Yes, it is. It was something that they discussed, um, but it's what they, what the committee voted for, um, the discussions they brought up, they still wanted to, they really wanted to keep their community tight. It was very important to them. And the survey results that we were presented, we weren't presented survey results based on zoned areas. So I don't have the votes for, we weren't presented with the results for just Hubenick. So I don't know what the residents of Humanic preferred. If they preferred option two or option three, that was undisclosed to us. So the only information we could go on was the information that was given to us with the total number of surveys that were sent out. So the total number of surveys that were sent out to all schools, uh, can you pull the slide up that shows the, uh, the breakdown of who responded to the surveys, which campuses? Um, give me a second. Okay, so we had did have responses, but you could, as you can see, it shows that 22% from Adolphus, 29, 37 for Hubnick. I don't actually know what those 37% said. It was sure. undisclosed to us because they wanted it to be um, more of an open representation of how everybody would feel. Um, so the survey results didn't show, even though they had the most responses, Hubnick did, they had 37% responding. Their survey results didn't show that it didn't relay over. 
Um, and I did go through and read the comments and people did put on the bottom. And we, we were given all those additional comments. It was page, I don't know how many pages it was of additional comments. It was a very, very long list. And even reading through those, um, the committee together decided uh, on option one, which provides some relief to Hubneck, not as significant as the other options do, but they still felt that that was gonna be a, a good decision um, for us to go with. Yeah, can I just say, um, I was looking at the numbers, and so with option one, Adolphus, option one and option three, Adolphus stays the same, Bentley stays the same, Huvenac gains 200 students in the first year, um, McNeil still gets some relief, um, they, get relie they get a little bit more relief with option one, but they still see relief with option three, Terrell stays the same, and um, elementary school 35 stays the same. So really, it's Hubenac is gaining 200 students in the first year. I will say my home campus is McNeil Elementary, so we serve as an overflow campus. And while that number does say like 923 right now, and it says 743 for next year, right now we are above 900. And if we stay the overflow campus, we're gonna still be over 900. This does not show that we're the overflow campus. And we have people, uh, students that are bused in from other areas that come to make. So, do you know what areas those are? Would those be schools that are uncapped? Because wouldn't wouldn't um, Lindsay and Tamron? Would any of them go to? McNeil? So, so Ms. Box, yes. In option one, Hubenac would continue to stay capped. Um, they have about 180 something students that currently go to McNeil Elementary would stay there. Um, the Triple C uh, Campus Capacity Committee has met, um, and what we're looking at is probably changing that overflow campus from McNeil for next year and basically stopping the overflow from Human Act to McNeil and flowing them in a different direction. But yes, option one does keep Human Act, even though those additional 200 uh, students are there in their attendance zone, those 200 students will have to go to another campus in option one for next school year. And that's, that's something they said that was, well, that was something that we did ask about and that we were told that that's kind of a separate committee. So this is just discussing the boundaries themselves. Um, and then of course there's like future projections for new campuses opening. Um, and this it's kind of hard because this was, we were only, the, you can't see everything on these numbers. Um, and the only reason that I know personally that McNeil has such an overflow, we have almost 30 students in some of our fifth grade classes. And I know that because I'm there on the campus, I'm also a substitute teacher there at the campus. And right now I'm serving as a permanent pre-K aide. So I'm there with these kids a lot. And I've seen how the kids we have coming over that are moved from other campuses, from when the ones that I know, they're doing really well at McNeil. And I'm glad that they're doing well at McNeil. And I like that they're, it's becoming home for them. Um, and I, McNeil is, I, I love our school. And I know a lot of our schools in LCISD are, going to take these kids in and give them a home even when they need it. Um, I know that this projection that we have set up with option one does not give the relief that everybody wishes it does, but the support system of LCISD is there to help these students through. They're not going to be crammed in like sardines, even though I know the numbers on the screen show that. Yeah, There's a support system there for them, I feel, and it's... We do have the legacy clause in place, which I taught, which they talked about as well. So I know personally a fourth grader that is a rezone to McNeil because of an, they're an overflow from another school, and they've made their home there, and they'll be able to continue their fifth grade year there as well. You mentioned several times one of the um, com comments from the committee was they wanted to keep communities together. Were you meaning neighborhoods? Did some of this? They see that some neighborhoods wouldn't. Yes. So they did feel like the neighborhoods kind of needed to stay a little bit together. So, for example, Parkway Lakes was a big discussed one. If you pull up the bone, zone boundary, I don't know if you're familiar with that area, it's the area over by Sam's Club. Um, that one was a very heavily impacted area. I love that we had a rep from there, and she talked about how um, the moving the communities around kind of really um, affects the kids. They get bounced around quite a bit, and then with the new elementary schools being built again, uh, coming up elementary school 36 coming up in the 25 26 school year there's possibilities of them getting moved again um, which is something that I know he's thought very thoroughly on and they that community goes now to McNeil or Hubenick Cur currently they do go to so 
they go to Hubert. They go to Hubert. Yeah, the section that you're looking at is the Allure District West Apartments, and then you have the Club Estates at Parkway Lakes, the Meadows at Parkway Lakes, and the Grand Meadows at Parkway Lakes. Um, that section that you're looking at is, is Grand Parkway as it comes down. So that's the, the one section that was. If you'll look at option three is the one that we were looking at possibly moving over to McNeil permanently. It was an option three. So you leave Adolphus attendance on the way it was. That section east of 99 would stay east of 99 it wouldn't have to go across grand parkway and by doing that that's how the projections change that's how hubernet becomes uncapped and then the 891 sits down in mcneil as you look at that so that's why option three came about was to use 99 grand parkway as our dividing boundary and keep those from having to go back and forth and Bodie would be moving those sections of grand the Grand Parkway that we looked at in option three, the Parkway Lakes section, all three sections that north and south of Bel Air would shift into McNeil. So I don't know if that, that quite answered your question. And this was also taken into account. There's elementary school 37, which isn't, we didn't talk about its attendance boundary, but when it opens, there was, they were advising us that those people, if we move them, might, might move again. When elementary school 37 opens up, if you could but to answer your question that I think Mr. Welch had was, yes, Human X has been capped since 21, and this would continue to keep it capped um, all the way through 25 would be the first year. So it would be four years capped. Mm -hmm. And their students would be attending both McNeil and another elementary school because McNeil won't be handling their overflow next year. Another campus would have to handle that overflow as well. But, but when it's uncapped, it's still going to be over 900 students. Which is more than the, is that right? So when you look at McNeil on this one, it drops below capacity. So in option three, it gets back within the building. Option one, no, it would continue to stay in portables unless something were to happen. That's what I mean. So we take option one, the, the ABC recommendation. Hubenac is uncapped, but it's still over capacity as far as what the building is built for. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll be capped for 24-25. Right. Uncapped in 25-26 and still in portables. Still in portables. That's that's, that's what I mean. Yes, sir. Not, not, not everybody, not all the kids inside the physical building. That's what I mean by over capacity. That's correct. Yes. It's not over capacity in function-wise, but it's, it, it has the, the temporary buildings. Yes, sir. And, and all options presented at least two schools that stay in portables. Yeah. And none of these numbers take into account uh, it wouldn't it would be the opening of 36. 36 it keeps so the fall of 24 is the opening of Terrell and then the numbers from fall of 25 fall of 26 fall of 27 is the opening of 35 which would be on the Tomas high school site but no sir we we didn't have options for 37 that would open up possibly in the fall of 26 or fall of 27. I just know as long as I've been on this board, even before then, Hubenek has always been mm -hmm. overcrowded, has had two schools in it. They, they, they miraculously do an excellent job. I mean, the school runs beautifully, but at some point, this school needs to, I mean, it just seems every time we would try to open another school, we open Adolphus, we open, it still was, overcrowded we just we keep finding band-aids for that school and just nothing ever works and I don't know if it's just the area they're in or if we're ever gonna just have to finally get more schools built out that way which we've been trying to do yes, and then hopefully 37 might alleviate but somehow I just human ec has been that one school that we've been dealing with for years trying to figure out a way to bring the numbers down and yes, every time we move somebody, more, another neighborhood opened. So. so with the survey results, can we sh see those again? Yes. The numbers for one and... So it was very close. Option yeah, one and three were both close. chosen. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, option one and, one and three were close, and then when you look at the longer, like people saw this, the so maps for the longer in, term. Well. In 24-25, they preferred option mm -hmm. three, but yeah. then in 25-26, it shifted a little bit to option one. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the differences, option three, that is 
So the one that they have preferred for option one included moving those sections over. That was the highest rank from, from the survey results that got put out is they would rather that shift over. I, I, I'm assuming the only effect that they had is they didn't, they didn't prefer the attendance zone of 35 as much in option three as they did during option one. But the shifting of Parkway Lakes is part of that option one that the survey preferred more than option three. And like you can see, elementary school 37 is right on that border, which should relieve some of those Hubnick students once it opens, even though it's not part of our committee. That's part of the reason why we didn't really want to move the students and then have to move them again. Greg, I have a question. Um, I feel like I remember that at some point, because I know there was public comment about Kingdom Heights to Bentley, and on here it shows Bentley going pretty far down in numbers to 500s, but did we run the numbers for Kingdom Heights and decide that if we were to send Kingdom Heights to Bentley that 35 would open capped? So currently right now at the 716, they would open the 24-25 school year, more than likely Bentley would be capped when it opened. Um, the thing that we're looking at is you have Sorrento and Candela South that is in the Bentley neighborhood, um, and they are really putting up homes there in a hurry. Um, and that number may drop to 526, it may stay down there, or it may go back up. Um, there's just those two major developments that are just south of Bentley that we're worried about for both of them because they're really ramping up right now. Okay. There's also one uh, west of Bentley as well. That is correct. There's the one on the, on the west side, west side the, that's yeah, Sorrento, which is D.R. Horton. Oh, and they are just, man, D.R. Horton's putting up homes right after another. Candela South, they've already got all the roads done. I have all the utilities. Um, and from what we've been talking about with Johnson Development, they're planning on having pad mounts and houses up before beginning of school, which is a little faster than they originally had told us. And Adolphus stays pretty high, too, in all of these. Yeah, its numbers don't change, Excuse actually, me. at all. Can I, I'm sorry to interject, but I know it's not going to Okay. It's, it's about no communication with Mr. Buchanan. No sorry. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, yeah, I do. Oh, yep. Um, pivoting off of Mrs. Hotzel's point, this is for the Kingdom Heights folks. They're putting up the neighborhoods left and right and they're selling homes, we anticipate. Are, are those numbers, those anticipated numbers not built into your projections here? They currently are. They are. But they're based on the information that we have gotten and the rate at which they're putting in. So there's a difference between them saying, hey, we plan on closing 100 homes a year and building that many. And then all of a sudden they ramp up and they say, oh, homes are selling faster. We're going to 200 now just because we can and they're selling. So that's something that we have to monitor. We monitor it every month. Every month we come in and we look at it and say, hey, you said we were going to build 25 homes this month. Did you build 25 or did you build 55? So the number of projections are built into these. But again, the dynamics of the economy continually change. So just because they tell us one thing and we build those projections in doesn't mean that due to, in some areas, they may slow down and those numbers shrink. But yes, the projections are built into it. But the projections are, again, the information that we've gotten from them. And then we have to actually go out there and physically look at it and say, reality says they're doing faster or they're going slower than what they said. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but again, there's, you know, the further those numbers go out, the less reliable those numbers become right. just because of the number of factors that are in there. Right. So, yes, you could move Kingdom Heights, but then possibly be capped. And then once it does and those neighborhoods do get to a certain point, then we're rezoning again because Bentley's full. So we would just be moving it to move it again or some other areas during that time. And, and I'm sorry, what, when did you think that would happen, that it could possibly get re, get filled up again? I, I missed well, so, so if you're looking at this right now, there's, I believe there's just over 300 students currently with coming out of Kingdom Heights. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like 330, something like that. I have to pull the actual numbers. Once you look at that, plus the development of those neighborhoods, well, Kingdom Heights has continued to grow as well. 
So with that growth and the other neighborhoods growing, yes, you would probably look at it capped in 24. It would probably dip during 25, become uncapped, and would possibly be capped again in about 26, 27. And at that time, we would be capping and overflowing those and then looking at where we need to level again. Okay, thank you. So you're basically saying if we sent Kingdom Heights to Bentley, can it be in the same situation we're currently in with sending Kingdom Heights to Frost because the neighborhoods around Bentley are going to possibly explode in growth. And we have a, another neighborhood that is being transported into Bentley. That's correct. It that really should be going to Jackson because it's two miles away. Is is. Yes, sir. What, what I'm saying is we have some underutilized campuses that are closer to that neighborhood yeah. than, than a campus that we look at that we see developments coming around. Yes, these are our projections. Um, but again, once you put, because it's a large community, it's, it's not like it's 100 kids, 150 students. Um, it's a large community that has continued to grow. Yeah. So because of that, you know, we have to keep that factor into all these numbers. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Okay. Um, is there a motion? I want to make a motion to put forth option three. <clears throat> While I appreciate the work that the ABC did, I feel like yeah. Hubenek has not seen relief in many, many years. And um, that all the numbers remain the same and Hubenac goes, goes, is the only one that goes up by 200 students. Um, I just feel like the other way, with, with option three, everybody sees some sort of relief in, in some sort of way. So. Okay, is there a second? Oh, second. Okay, any discussion? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I really don't like ruling against the, or voting against the ABC, because I really respect the, public's input, um, but Hubenac is the, Hubenac seems to be pressing in my mind stronger than the others right now, so um, I, I'm going to support option three on this vote and see how it goes. Well, and I also think the community did speak as well, and it was very, very close, um, so I don't know. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, I'll now call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Um, against? Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, we will now have reports and presentations on the information items. All right. Uh, Madam President, Mr. Buchanan is going to talk about an update to our uh, bus rider management system. Good evening, Board Trustees and Dr. Nivens. Um, so some current issues, if you remember back not, not too long ago, in, in August of 23, this was one of the headlines that we had, um, some frustrated parents as we went to our um, four-tier bell system um, for our transportation during our school start times. Um, and, and this was our, our tardy bus. So what a tardy bus is, is a bus that arrives at a campus after the first bell. So if you look during the first two days of school, we had 95 uh, buses arriving late, which is Roughly about 18% of all of our buses were running to the campus after the first bell. Um, as you can continue to see, as, as the weeks progressed, um, we started getting better and better, and we've continued to refine that. We're averaging less than one tardy bell a week right now for the entire week. So one thing that we currently have is through our, our bus rider registration is, is currently our practice has been that we route every student, whether they request transportation or not. There has not been a, a, a method for a parent to say, we would like to see, receive bus services or we don't want to receive bus services. So by doing that, we have to route 4,900 students, even though we don't have the ability to transport that many as well. So right now we're averaging between 20,000 and 21,000 students per day. So an example of that would be a bus route that has 183 students assigned to it, but only 50 students ride that bus every day. So there may be 20 stops on that bus route that we start the school with because we don't know which of the 183 will be riding. Well, and only 11 of those 20 bus stops have students at it. So that chart that we showed you how it refined better and better is, so as students stop riding buses or not riding buses at all, they get removed from the bus route. If we continue to go by stops, stops after day, and those students are getting off, we start removing those stops because those students aren't there. So it takes a time for us to be able to get that 
through the system to be able to know what students are actually riding, which students aren't. Um, currently, our uh, bus rider management system, our current system that we have now, it only allows us to update any changes that we make to any bus route twice a day. So it gets made at noon at 1 p.m. and then it gets made at 11:59. So if a campus calls or a parent calls and says I need bus services, we may update it within the routing system at 2 p.m. But the parent won't see it until they get up the next morning of, hey, where's my bus stop? What time am I supposed to get up? And I'll have to figure that out in the morning because it doesn't update it in real time. So the other thing is our current solution in our routing system, which is Versatrans, the information doesn't flow back and forth. It flows one way in and it does not flow back. The other uh, our current solution that we have, you have to get through a web browser to be able to monitor the bus or to be able to see anything that happens. It does not have a smartphone app for you to be able to download an app and be able to access that app on the phone. No matter what bus rider management system you currently have, I mean, there's technology involved. So there's tablets and there's card readers in every bus. Um, if you can only imagine what a tablet and a card reader within a, your car would be like, but imagine during a school bus, where every four years, that's the life expectancy of that equipment. So every four years, we're gonna have to pull all those tablets and card readers out. Um, currently, we are due to, to replace all that equipment this coming summer. So now we're starting to look at some, some solutions. Um, what we've come up with was a bus rider registration form. Um, the registration form will be housed inside Skyward. Um, it will be assigned to every student, much like all the other forms that we currently have for parents. The forms will be attached to each year. So this would be something that would be filled out year after year as things change. So what we're looking at is asking just three questions um, for our form. First, will your student ride the bus during the first two weeks of the 24-25 school year? So what we're looking at doing is smoothing out those first two weeks instead of having that large hiccup as we come back. And it would be simple, yes or no. Um, the second uh, question that we would ask is, what is your student's main form of transportation to school? And it would be car, rider, bike rider, daycare, or bus. And then our third question is the same question for the afternoon. Um, the reason that we added the two other questions on there was it helps our campus staff know how many walkers, bike riders do I have, how many car pickups, how many in daycare, how many buses, so they can better plan for the first two weeks of school and know how much staff they need to allocate to what areas, depending on the fluctuation in the number. So the communication plan uh, that we've developed out is we've communicated this to our principals and got feedback from them today. Um, we're communicating to the Board of Trustees this evening. Um, we're gonna present this plan to the assistant principals on Thursday. Um, April 1st, the form will go live in Skyward um, and we'll be posting messages on the transportation website along with um, putting out messages on Sky Alerts. So in April and May, we'll send out one in April and one in May for every, we can send out Sky Alerts plus per bus route. So we can send that information to the form, um, informing all the parents that current students that ride our bus, that this is a form that you need to fill out for transportation. We'll do that in April and May. We're also gonna put backpack flyers out in April and May um, to get that word to our parents. And then in April through September, we're gonna keep it in our campus monthly newsletters. Um, so every newsletter that comes out from the campus along with the district-wide um, newsletter, it will be put out. Those um, information will be in there as well. Um, the communication plan that we have now is on June the 17th, July the 15th, and August the 1st, we'll send out a message to every parent that hasn't completed the form. This says, you haven't completed the form. If you don't complete the form, you know you're not going to receive transportation come the first two weeks of school. So we'll send that out three separate times. On August the 5th, we'll send out a, a message that says, you have signed up for transportation. Um, here's the app that you can download and monitor the app as we continue to run those. It allows us to use the first week of before school starts to finalize all the routes, know what students are there, to be able to run those routes Thursday and Friday before school starts for our bus drivers to know where they're at and to check the timing of them. So any parent that completes the form by August the 4th will receive transportation on the first day of school, which is August the 12th. Any form that's completed between August the 5th and August the 21st will receive transportation beginning August the 26th, which is the third week of school. So what this will do is allow us to get through the first two weeks to get everything smoothed out. And then once they complete that transportation form during that period, then the third week of school transportation will pick up for those students. So any form that would be completed after August the 22nd will receive transportation within five days. Um, someone will be able to get on sooner, 
because there may already be stops there. Some of them it might take a little longer because we may have to redevelop the route or shift some depending on the student load. So our current practice is, is if a parent fills out this form after the 22nd, if they need to change that status, they contact the campus to say, I'm not a car rider, I'm going to daycare, or I'm going to be um, going on the bus. That will not change for our campuses. So again, that process will stay exactly the same. Um, the other system that we're looking at is leaving our current system and going to Tyler Drive. Um, Tyler Drive is a um, software, another software platform that's the same as our routing system. So what it does is it allows for communication to be instantaneous. So any changes that are made in the bus system automatically updates within the, uh, the Tyler Drive, which is the parent app that they'd be able to look at. So if a campus calls and says, I need to add this student to a stop, they add it to the stop. As soon as they add it, it automatically updates on the portal for the campus, and it also updates on the parent on the app. So they can immediately track anything and see any of those changes in real time. The other thing is because it's integrated with our VersaTrans routing system, information flows in and out of that system. So it's not just locked into information going one direction. Um, Tyler Drive does have an app, so a parent will be able to download an app to have an app on their phone and just push the app instead of having to log into a web browser to be able to access this information. Again, we will be changing out all the equipment um, May the 15th through June the 15th. Um, so we have roughly about 450 buses that will be pulling all this equipment out and redoing that equipment within a small little window of time. And we are planning on using summer school as our pilot. Um, so we'll be rolling this out in this uh, new rider management system um, for them to be able to monitor, to be able to make any tweaks or adjustments that need to be made before school begins. I know there's a lot of information. Do you have any questions? I have a few. So with the Tyler Drive, what you said at the beginning about parents have to say yes or no, is that part of that? Two, or is this in place of Tyler? No, ma'am. So Tyler Drive is the actual badge where you badge on and off the okay. bus. But you're still the, looking at doing the program of... Yes, ma'am, because okay. if, if we don't fill out that form and say yes or no, we'll end up routing. You know, we're projected to have 45,000, 46,000 kids next year. We're routing 46,000 kids right. and not knowing which one of the 21,000 will actually be routing. And we'll be sending this both in Spanish and English to all the yes, parents and... What about new students to the district? So if they're registering after August 5th, they're not going to get transportation? So what we've done is, is we've worked with our, registrar, our registration, our student services department. What they will do is after April 1st, any student that registers, this is part of their registration packet. Okay. Now, when we normally go back, you'll have your back to school forms that are the, well, they're happening between August the 5th and August the 10th. Well, those during that time, we won't be able to get the information back fast enough to be able to build the routes. So that's why this is only for our current students. Our SPED students are separate. So it doesn't affect our SPED students. It doesn't affect our campus-to-campus um, -campus shuttles for our staff. Has nothing to, to affect any of that. This is just our regular ed students that we currently have within the system. And does that information go back to the campuses, letting them know which students are riding which buses? Do they get that information? Yes, ma'am, they'll get that the first week. But what they will be able to do is they, just like any other form in Skyward, they will be able to pull down that data and disaggregate that data to know who filled it out, who hasn't filled it out. Um, and also, they'll be able to pull that data down to say, okay, here's my list of car riders, here's my list of walkers, right. here's my list of daycare. Um, so they'll be able to pull that data down at any point in time they want to. And principals over the summer, can they pull it down and try to contact those parents that have not? Yes, ma'am. Um, but we're planning on those those three dates that we talked about for communicating to those June 17th, July 15th, and August 1st. We're planning on both doing an email and a call to parents. And I guess during the beginning of school when they have those before school meetings where the parents come in, the yes, teacher can say, "This remember, this is what you chose <laughs> yes, to remind parents what they decided to do because they might change their mind. I see it better for you. I see some problems that parents might think, well, because I didn't get it on time, my child's being punished not to be able to get on the bus. But again, this is trying to make it more efficient for the district with 45,000 kids. Okay. So this is for elementary and secondary? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so what if like a high schooler shows up at the bus stop? 
I mean, is the bus driver going to be like, eh, you're not on my list, you can't get on the bus? I'm just asking because, I mean, or were they, they were like, oh, man, I can't, I've lost my, missed my ride to school, but I can still catch the bus after school. Go get on my bus. I, I, after school would be a different. Um, in the morning, I mean, we would have to take the student's safety into consideration if a student's at a stop. I'm just saying, because secondary students would yes, do that kind of thing. Their parents aren't home. Yes, they missed their ride. They're just going to go catch the bus. Or yes, ma'am. If they're there in the morning, it's definitely a safety issue. We don't want to leave students without, you know, within the neighborhood. If they're at a bus stop, we would pick them as up. As long as it's not 30 kids doing it on one bus. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That, that, that's where, you know, we would have to start adjusting and looking at that. But coming home is where we would have to say these are the people that have ride because um, the afternoon is where the traffic is really hitting us the most. Um, but if they're at a current stop, yeah, yes, ma'am, we won't just... I mean, because when high schoolers get on the bus, it's not like they're being led to their bus and tracked, and or maybe when they badge on. But yes, ma'am. So it's not like it... anybody's got a line and they're like, follow me to the bus. You know, it's totally different. So. Yes, ma'am, but the card lets them know. So the system, when they card on, if they're not on the register for the bus, it sends out a red alert that says you don't belong on this bus. Because oh. you may belong on another bus or you don't. Yeah, you so it, it alerts them in the afternoon. In the morning, you know, for student safety, we would we would definitely, just, you know, we're yeah. going to take them to school. Gotcha. Okay. The uh, timelines there um, on when uh, parents can request transportation, and so we we're doing this now, you know, for a reason. Of course, everything is strategic uh, because we're talking about this in March, and it's actually going to go into to effect in August. And so uh, we're going to push out a lot of information on the website. We're going to have phone calls to parents. But we know when the decision is made and when it happens, we're going to get the emails and the calls about, you know, we're not being transparent and, you know, we didn't say anything about it. And so we're going to push out as much information as possible um, via email, via website, via phone calls. But I'm just, I'm just saying it now that when it comes, <laughs> same, th you know, same, same thing about the rezoning piece, right? We were talking about it for six months and, you know, everything. So when it comes, I just want to pre prepare everyone that when it comes, we'll get the same conversations about, you know, we, we didn't say anything. And so we're going to push out as much information as possible. Um, and so when, when, Mr. when Mr. Buchanan and, and uh, uh, Mr. Sluter came to me with the plan, uh, it sounds great, it looks great, and I'm, I'm, I'm approving it. But I just want to make sure that we go in eyes wide open that when, yeah, when, when, they, when they miss the timeline, that, you know, we'll, we'll get some public comments about it. Uh, but we'll do everything we can to make sure we push out as much information as possible, as frequently as possible. I have one more question to just maybe think what she said, what Trustee Box said. Um, so if a student is not signed up in the morning, um, will the system, like after three weeks, reroute that bus? Okay, yes, this person lives over here. There's no stop. They're, it'll be a set route no matter what. So that bus driver has to drive that speed that route, even though no one signed up, they'll just keep going. So, so remember the example that we talked about is if I'm on an elementary A tier, right. if I deviate from my route and add five or six minutes to it, it's going to just continue to snowball. And by the time I get to my middle school, junior high, I'm going to be getting to the school late. Right. So, so that's why we're developing those routes, knowing exactly what kids are there so we can maximize the efficiency and know what students are riding and what students aren't, and then be able to slowly add those students on. Because right now what we're doing is we're taking an educated guest on who's going to ride the bus, where the stops need to be, and it takes us the first two or three weeks of school to flush it all out to get where we could be using this possibly within the first week of school. So if, this, if, if the system says, okay, we should have X amount of people's riding, and then after it flushes out and we say this X number over here is not here, but the system can figure out a faster way to get there, it won't remove that stop even though there's a potential student that can go there. Yes. Okay. That's, I think that helps with her question of volley gift for students. Happens to show, but if they never ride, okay, because sense. some students, especially at the secondary level, they may go a mile to the wrong stop to get on, right? Because okay. they want to be with their friends or other things like that. Thank you. All right, board. We have uh, Miss uh, Mrs. Katie Martina to come give us an instructional update. Good evening, President Bronzel, Board of Trustees, Dr. Nivens. I'm thrilled to be here this evening to share an overview of our K-12 math program with you all. Um, you can see here an, a commitment statement from our LCISD math team. Lamar CISD is committed to providing a superior mathematics education for all students so that as graduates, they will have mathematical competence to enable them to achieve their full potential. 
Our mathematical information for teachers is outlined in our LCISD instructional handbook, and more specifically for elementary, details are outlined in the guide to LCISD elementary mathematics and through curriculum resources housed in the Canvas courses. Our instructional minutes um, for K-5, each, math, each student has math for approximately 80 to 90 minutes. And at high school, each student has math for one class period each day. And you can see here how, our, how that math block is divided up. Every student starts with a math warm-up, deep practice, numerical fluency, and number talks at the elementary level. And then at secondary, more deep practice and um, mathematical warm-up skill review, and then they move on to whole class instruction, a mini lesson of sorts, and then small group instruction, which couldn't be math conferencing, math workshop, or math assessment. Each grade level or con grade level is divided out, as you see on the screen, based on the length of minutes they have, and each campus creates their own schedule. When we think about how our mathematical instruction is happening, we have state adopted resources at each level. At elementary, we use Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, Texas Go Math. And at secondary, in six through eight, we have McGraw Hill resources, Glencoe Math for six through eight, and then Pearson for most of our high school courses, um, with the exception of pre-calculus, where we have a Cengage state adopted resource. We have a number of supplemental resources available for our teachers to meet the specific needs of their students. You can see here a variety of those resources, both at elementary and secondary. They continue on here to the next slide. In addition to purchase resources, we have a variety of district created curriculum resources. As we dig deeper into elementary mathematics, our elementary math instruction, daily instruction is, follows the guided math framework from Laney Sammons. Within this framework, teachers strive to provide learning environment that supports mathematical thinking and meets the needs of all students. And you can see the guided math framework components there on the slide. Teachers follow the concrete representational abstract model. They use this to help students develop a deeper understanding of math mathematical concepts by gradually transitioning from concrete experiences to abstract representations. We spend a lot of time at elementary developing number fluency and fact fluency. We specifically have an LCISD fluency plan that is designed to help students develop flu fluency and automaticity with their basic, basic math facts. It's accomplished through a balanced approach that focuses on conceptual understanding during daily instruction, the instruction of math fact, fact strategies, and the continued practice of mastering automaticity through daily work with grade level fluency activities. You can see here on the screen the breakdown of the kin kindergarten fact fluency strategies. Each row is in nine weeks. Here is a snapshot of the fact fluency overview for kindergarten and in this fact fluency plan, the numeracy strategies for each grade level are organized by nine weeks, skills building complexity throughout the year and from grade level to grade level. So I'll give you just a brief snapshot. This is kindergarten, first grade and second grade. You can see we're starting addition and subtraction in first and second grade. Moving on to third grade where we introduce multiplication and then in fourth and fifth grade, of course, addition and subtraction, multiplication and division. The math fact fluency strategies are taught through the use of number talks. During number talks, students are encouraged to explain and justify and make sense of mathematics. Teachers engage in number talks with students during the warm up piece of instruction at least three times each week. We have a specific focus on problem solving in all of our mathematics classrooms. On the screen you see the mathematics problem solving plan that LCISD follows. As we dig deep, it looks a little bit different at elementary than it does at secondary. At elementary, we use the three reads protocol developed by Donna Boucher. Students read the problem first to understand context. They read the problem, that same problem again to understand the quantities in the word problem. And then we encourage them to read a third time where they're really focused in on the question that they need to answer. In secondary, 
to help students develop their problem solving skills, we use the think along plan where students and teachers focus in on the same problem for the entire week through their warm up process. On Monday, they're digging into the, to the stimulus or the text involved in the question and the pictures that are included, but they're not looking at the question itself. Then on Tuesday, they're talking about what they know, what is important in this story and how would they get started solving. On Wednesday, they actually solve. On Thursday, they compare that question that they've been studying to another question that is very similar. And then on Friday, they're reflecting on their learning. Again, this, is help, this helps them develop a deeper process for attacking problems that they may come across. Moving into secondary, we have um, a specific compacted curriculum beginning in middle school mathematics. We offer two math pathways that allow le learners to pursue the opportunities that best fit their mathematical goals, either on level or advanced. Students following the advanced math pathway would take Algebra 1 as an eighth grader. Just recently in the, 20, in the 88th legislature, um, we have the Senate Bill 2124 that requires the district to enroll students who perform at the top 40% of star fifth grade math into that advanced math pathway. And we have to have a plan and we have to lay that out for parents. Parents may opt out of that automatic enrollment. You can see here the different courses at each level depending on the on-level pathway or the advanced math pathway. Again, the change happens in middle junior high where they're compacting curriculum so they can take eighth grade algebra one. Grade six math pre-AP, that advanced math pathway has all of the sixth grade teaks in addition to half of the seventh grade teaks. Our students in sixth grade pre-AP take the sixth grade star test because they haven't mastered all those seventh grade teaks yet. In seventh grade, they're mastering the other half of seventh grade teaks and all of the eighth grade teaks so they're tested on the eighth grade star assessment. Progress monitoring throughout looks very similar as it did in ELA in our conversations earlier this year. Our kindergarten teachers administer the text Kia assessment in beginning, middle, and end of the year. It has a mathematics component. The mathematics subtest specifically focuses on math skills related to numbers and counting, operations, patterning, and math in the real world. In grades one all the way up through algebra two, we use the map growth assessment. Again, that's an interim adaptive assessment. And you can see here all of the different mathematical components that are included in the map growth test. In addition to these two progress monitoring assessments, teachers use quick formative assessments and summative classroom assessments to monitor progress. We give a district-wide fall benchmark and spring benchmark for those grade levels that are tested with STAR and then STAR is our end of year assessment. Teachers use the data that they're gathering through that assessment process to provide intervention and enrichment as needed for students, and that intervention and enrichment time is built into campus daily schedule. To look specifically at third grade math STAR data as a checkpoint as to where we stand, just a reminder when we're looking at STAR data, we have levels of masters meets approaches and did not meets grade level. Approaches grade level is the minimum passing standard for STAR. When we look at our third grade STAR data from 2023, 83% of our third grade students met approaches or above. 55% of our students performed at the meets level or above. And 23% of our students performed at the master's level or above, well, or the, at the master's level. You can see on the screen, the blue bars are the state comparison and the regional comparison for region four. So we're above the state and region at approaches, meets, and mastered. To ensure that our teachers have everything that they need to be able to deliver high quality instruction for students, we provide a, a variety of professional development opportunities. Two specific opportunities that have been designed to target need is the guided math cadre for teachers in grades K through three. Participating teachers are represented by a vertical team from their campus. They attend a workshop series for the entire school year and they dig deep into guided math, working with the author, Donna Boucher, the author of Guided Math Workshop and Guided Math Workstations. 
You can see here a few of our teachers participating in that opportunity. After the completion of this third year of cadre, we will have vertical teams from 27 of our 30 elementary campuses that have participated. We also have specific professional development to address needs in seventh grade mathematics. This is our second year of the seventh grade math summit, a professional learning series for teachers specifically designed to address that post COVID dip. During the seventh grade summit, teachers focus in on the TEKS for seventh grade, really de developing a deep understanding of the content, the standards and the curriculum resources um, to use with their students. Teachers leave each session with hands-on lessons and activities that they can implement right away. In addition to these two specific opportunities, our campus instructional coaches, our district level math content specialists, and our district level coordinators provide support for teachers in coaching, professional development, modeling in the classroom, and support during the PLC process. We also provide lots of specific math professional development opportunities throughout the school year and in summer based on our assessment data and the needs that we've identified through conversations with teachers and administrators. I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, okay, so you said we have um, the KEA assessments. Is that an, a test or is that just something that a teacher works through as the students are doing their work and then they look at their work? Are you asking about the Texkia assessment? Yeah, maybe that's it. The K is it KEA? In kindergarten? So Texkia is an assessment that's been developed at the state okay. level, okay, for kindergarten. Um, it is a one-on-one -on -one assessment. So okay. it's an interview process okay. where they're working through specific skills with the student and they're developing or uh, demonstrating mastery and then the teacher's recording that information okay. and that information is sent off to the state. Okay, and at what grade do they start MAP? MAP Maps testing and benchmark. Map is grade one. Okay. First grade and all the way up through algebra two. Um, and then benchmarks. Benchmark is star tested grade levels, so it starts in third grade, third grade. and works up for mathematics through algebra one. So they do all that along with the the testing regular testing six weeks testing or just like the benchmark or the maps test count as a, you know a date a double grade like a test. Um, it depends the. Teacher has that autonomy to make okay. that decision. MAP is not usually graded because it is an adaptive assessment. So your assessment might look different than my assessment based on how we're answering those questions. That test is changing and so we're not assessed equally, right? But the fall benchmark and the spring benchmark are gonna test TEKS that we've already taught. Mm -hmm. So we can assess mastery using those TEKS. Okay. And then one last thing, the math cadre. Um, mm -hmm. So when the teachers go and they, they learn those things, they come back and they share that with their math team? How do they do that? Like, when do they do that? When do they have the time to do that kind of thing? Right, so it's a vertical team. It's one kindergarten teacher, one first grade teacher, one second grade teacher, and one third grade teacher. And the expectation is that they are going back to their planning meetings, their PLC oh, okay. conversations, and sharing what they've learned. So okay. they're going back with resources, they're going back with examples, and they're, the coach is along there with them to help facilitate that conversation. So we all PLCs. do that again next year as well, until all the schools have been? The plan is to continue to get as many uh -huh. covered as possible, yeah. Awesome. As long as the need exists. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Oh, sorry. Can you go to the screen about the third grade math scores? Yes. Star. Nope, that's fine. I, I want to ask a question that I think a lot of parents might be asking, and a lot of folks who would just be looking at this from the outside. So we're, we are higher than the state average uh, in, as far as the meets category, well, all of them actually, but I'm talking about right. the meets category. Mm -hmm. Meets expectation is, am I seeing that right? 45% roughly for the state and we're 55%? So keep in mind the names are a bit deceiving and that the approaches is, is actually the minimum standard. Okay, so that is actually passing the test and then the meets grade level is the next level and the masters is the top level. So approaches passing, we're at 83%, the meets grade level at 55% and above the state average in both of those. So just the minimum that we expect a third grader to know in math, 83% of our third graders meet that expect that minimum standard, is that right? That is correct. So we have 17% of our And that, and that state students. average is 73%. That is correct. What, what can we do to get that to 93%? 
continue to work with our kiddos on growth, right? That's why we're using the progress monitoring assessments all the way down to first grade. So seeing where gaps are and then being really intentional about the interventions and support that we're providing for those students who are not meeting grade level to really increase their growth exponentially so they can hit that mark in third grade. I imagine that tails off to those 17% that aren't meeting that and, and as they get further in their schooling career that they're not getting the, the building blocks to continue on. And right, that's why that key three foundation is so critically important because we know that they need to hit that mark when they hit their grade. Mm -hmm. so is that like getting a 70? I mean, um, like if you were to it, put it on a grade scale? It, it varies year to year and grade level to grade level. So the, the bar changes every year based on what, how the state sets it. So trustees, as, as you know, uh, you know, right now the agency, Texas Education, Texas Education Agency, uh, they delayed our scores. And so if you recall, a couple, couple months ago, we had a conversation about uh, how the agency has changed the scale scores and the marks after the fact. And so, uh, you know, as our students take a test, we don't know what the mark is. And so, you know, our, our teachers are doing a phenomenal job of just trying to make sure our students learn as much as possible when they can. But we, we still don't know what the, what the scores are, even for last year's data. And so that's a conversation that, that uh, most, a lot of districts are having with the agency because it's a moving target. It's very hard to hit a moving target. And so uh, that's the conversation that we're having right now. But also to address your question, Mr. Welch, uh, you know, we talked about summer slide. And so, you know, we have programs during the summer where students are able to read. Uh, same thing in math, you know, we have STEM camps. We have a lot of things we like parents to be able to bring their students up over the summertime so we can assist with that. Uh, we have a lot of students, I don't say a lot of students, but we have some students who, um, who may not crack open a book at all during the summertime, you know? And we have some who will go travel and they'll read, they go to the library. And so uh, we try to fill in the gap as a school system to offer a lot of summer camps and the summertime ac activities so we can prevent that summer slide, so we can close that gap, when, so the gap won't be as wide when the school starts in August. So does the district reach out to maybe those students that don't, the 17% and say, hey, this is what we have going on in the summer, and these are the programs, yeah, okay. Absolutely, yep. So they're a targeted audience, for sure, so they're getting extra communication. Many of them might be involved in, um, like, Dr. Nivens mentioned a STEM camp, a jumpstart camp. A lot of our campuses will bring kiddos in before the school year starts and do jumpstart work with them prior um, grade level review and then jumpstart into the next year's curriculum. And that group who did not pass is the target audience for that. We won't get our star data until after the school year finishes. So it's that summer work that has to happen to prep for August. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any items on the future consent agenda items that trustees would like to pull for discussion at the April board meeting? I got one. Okay. 12K, discussion of instruction, instructional material recommendations. Uh, I think a presentation would be uh, good, talking about the process that the administration went through and, and why they chose certain materials over other materials. We get a, I get a lot of questions um, from yeah. folks who wanted to know why we chose this over that. And okay. Any others? Okay. It is now 8.53 p.m. We're adjourning to closed session pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.071, 551.072, 551.074, and 551.082 open meetings act to discuss personnel land acquisition or consultation with our attorney we're now back in open session it is 9 34 p.m. and we have a quorum um, are there any motions to be made yes madam president I move that the Board of Trustees approve the property lease as presented in closed session is there a second any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Any other motions? Yeah, I move that the Board of Trustees approve the superintendent's evaluation as discussed in closed session. Is there a second? Uh, any discussion? Nope. All in favor.
Well, who did? Oh, I didn't even know there was another one. That's either way, Jackie. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, any discussion? Wait, did I take the vote already? <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> any discussion? No. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Um, are there any future agenda items the board would like to add? No. Okay. The meeting is adjourned. It is 9.35 p.m.